Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, welcome, I think, to our last uh, session in the afternoon. Um, what we wanted to share with you briefly uh, was a sort of taste stroke overview of how we tackle the subject of Islamic law on our BA program, which is a three year course in Islamic studies. Now, the, the puzzle or the thing I would like you to maybe get a bit of a taste of, uh, the, the challenge, if you like, is how we go about dealing with a subject as intricate and complex as Islamic law in a way that gives students both a real hands-on taste, uh, grasp, grip of an old and ancient tradition, whilst having an understanding of how it intersects with today's world, what the challenges there are uh, at that interface, and what kind of questions there are that need to be answered. Uh, so it's just an overview of how we go about thinking about these questions a tradition in the world with some degree of you know, hands-on training, not simply just a one-off lecture like today's is. So Islamic law, uh, the science of law in Islam, is often the Arabic word for it is what? Fiqh, Fiqh is the Arabic word for that science. Uh, and the, the word is fascinating and it really is the, the point of departure for much of what I have to say. Because the word fiqh uh, translates as what? Yeah, we can call it deep understanding if you like. I don't have the best handwriting, just think of it as a symbol for what I'm saying and you can... It might get harder to read as, 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 as we go on. The idea of deep understanding, it's already something to think about. Why? Because where's the locus of understanding? It's you and me, right? Understanding is a human quality. When you think of law, our English term, you think of something that's outside of the human. It's something there, it's, it's objective. It's out whether you are understanding or not, the law is there. But that's not what fiqh is, the very title is not what the science is claiming. The science is a science of human understanding. What does that tell you straight away? What does it mean to be a faqih or an expert of this science? It's somebody with a particular capacity, a capacity to understand. And so, so therefore fiqh at its, off, at its very root is a rational activity. It's a human rational activity in order to bring about a human rational capacity. The capacity to deeply understand. You guys with me? So that's already a very different idea. And that's why the jurists say you are not a faqih, an expert of fiqh by memorizing law. You can memorize all the law in the world. You're not a person of fiqh because you haven't understood yet. Let's take it one level deeper. They say you can, you can memorize Okay, hadiths and Quranic verses that tie to explain particular statements of law. But have you got the understanding yet? The understanding is something that's behind those cases, those statements. What are those statements getting at? And so this understanding is applied to particular, we can say, legal statements. Legal statements then are statements, you know, such and such a thing is lawful, such and such a thing is unlawful, uh, such and such a transaction is valid or invalid, such an idea is a condition for the validity of something. These are legal statements. Sometimes we might call them legal cases, ideas, statements of law. What is this activity of fitness? It's not memorizing them. It's not simply knowing where they've come from, although obviously that's a condition. If you don't know what the statements are, you haven't got anything to, to work with. But that's not what the, what the goal of it is. That's like a given that you know the statements. The goal is this activity. It's an activity of deeply grasping what these statements are about, how they fit, 
What are the ideas underpinning them? That's called the faqih. And that's why they have a very interesting old phrase the jurists used to use in their bi biographical works. You know, when they want to say this guy is an absolute master jurist, one of the phrases they would use is, who are faqihun nafs. Okay, nafs, you know, Sufis have a bad relationship with the nafs, but otherwise nafs is just a word meaning your human soul, if you like. So the Sufis use that as well, but sometimes they specifically like nafs for the bad things within a person. But otherwise, nafs, think of nafs simply as, as, the, as the human soul. So the expert jurist is someone whose soul has deep understanding, you know, a real capacity to really work through the questions of law with deep insight. So the locus of fiqh is here then. The locus of fiqh is within you, that human subtlety that makes you a person, that makes you human. Now the goal of this activity, of course, applying the fiqh to these late legal statements is what? Why, why would someone seek to acquire a capacity of understanding? It's so that, like what, what's the advantage of all of this? The ultimate goal. Okay, and acting on it is ultimately because we want to uh, align ourselves obviously to who's on the top of, the, of everything. It's about God, right? It's about some sort of harmony between the human world and the will of God. That's what taklif is, moral responsibility. What is it? Why does someone seek understanding? It's so that when they go through life, they make informed decisions, right? Should I eat this or not? Should I buy this or not? Should I go here or not? Should I do this or not? Those are the moral questions every human being has to deal with. And that's why every human being has to aspire for a particular capacity in fiqh, a particular ability, a particular minimum, if you like, of some legal statements that are grounded, authoritative, a particular understanding of what they're about to whatever capacity so you can live an informed life. You can go through your responsibilities with some insight. And that's why fiqh then, it has an individual facing idea which is what I'm talking about, all of you and your children and your spouses and your friends, whoever seeks to live a life, uh, you know, in uh, conscious of God, you know, in submission to God, ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they need to, to whatever capacity they have, to understand what are the basic legal statements that have come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is the basic understanding behind them, so that whatever within that capacity of learning, they can live an informed life do the best they can and ask Allah, please accept what I've done. I think it's the right thing. I'm not sure. That's, that's the basic idea on the level of the individual. A personal striving with a limited capacity to do what's right. Yep. But fiqh has another angle, right? Because we wouldn't call this law in our normal ideas, this personal moral decision making. We would call that something like personal moral decision making. <laughs> But fiqh has another focus, right? We think about law, something which is reproducible. Somewhere where you can go to an authoritative figure and he'll tell you, yes, you should or shouldn't do something. Something predictable. Something we maybe think of with the word law. And so fiqh then has a societal face. The societal face is not simply every individual doing their best. It's born by some kind of professional class then. I, a group of experts, people who have specialized in a tradition of fiqh, uh, people who are in the capacity and the job of doing something we can call producing law. Now, law is a, again still an odd word to use because when we think of law, we cannot separate from the ideas of police, jails, judges, states, some enforcing authority. Uh, which is ultimately important as well, but we're not talking about that right now. When we think about Islamic law, studying it in Cambridge, we're not talking about police and judges right now, although that still is part of the puzzle, as we'll maybe look at in a little bit. But the idea simply is something predictable, because the laws are meant to be predictable. So in the level of individual capacity, you and your parents and your children will go through life and you'll think, I shouldn't eat this, and someone in your family said, no, but I think it's fine because the packet says, you know, these are individual, if you like, strivings. But the idea of something 
the society's need for law is something predictable. Are such forms of transactions correct or not? Ideally, you want something predictable. Some class of experts who have a definitive statement. That's what law needs. That's what that's society's need for law. Something fixed and predictable. Are such forms of marriage valid or invalid? And so on. Now, in this production of law that the professional class is aiming for, that law needs to have two features to it, to have any relevance, really. Number one, it needs to be grounded. And number two, it needs to be practical. When I say grounded, again, especially in our context, where there is no state and no jails enforcing questions of Islamic law, grounded means it has to have some basis. Uh, you could simply say simply a basis in some sacred past, if you like. It's part of a tradition which goes back to some early memory of prophetic teachings, ultimately. If it's divorced and detached from any such idea, then it's, it's not grounded in claiming this. And so it will never really have legitimacy in the eyes of a believing people. Let's just say it like that for now. So the question of grounding is important. And the other question is practicality. If you're a professional class, which you turn to, all they'll tell you is your marriages are invalid, your transactions are haram, your money is riba, you know, uh, you know and so on. We'll say, well, thank you very much, but uh, I'm going back to work. I mean, there's nothing I can do with that, that it's not speaking to me. And so this question of the practicality of law is actually essential. And it's figured into any Islamic legal tradition. Law is dealing not just with the ultimate realm of the timeless, it's dealing with the very palpable physical world of the flawed time and place that a person is in. A legal tradition that doesn't cater to that is not going to solve this equation. It can't. So it's important then. It's not simply an abstract religious activity. At its essence, it's a worldly activity. And that's why uh, this legal class, if you like, part of their training is, yeah, it's understanding what makes law grounded. It's an understanding of, you could say, sacred texts, and you could say sacred past, an idea of tradition. And the other thing that they have to think about is, yes, they have to always be trained in thinking about social norms and values. If they're not capable of thinking about social norms and values, both where they are and both in any part of the sacred past from which they're taking these legal statements, this is not a professional class because they're not capable of making law uh, because they're, they're, they're doing something else then. They're engaging in maybe you can say a pious activity, a personal enriching activity, but they're not producing law. They're not part of this equation. And that's why any legal tradition that's the puzzle that it's trying to square. And, and there is tension here. There's tension in dealing with this limited world of the here and the now, and dealing with an ultimate ideal, dealing with legal statements that come from a past. You have three notions of time, right? You have timeless statements, a timed sacred past of early legal statements, which every tradition connects back to, and you have your flawed, if you like, in comparative terms, different type of a context. There will always be tension. But that tension is part of the puzzle of law. It's part of the need for individuals in society to do their best to be faithful to God. And that's the job of these people. And it's a difficult job. Uh, it's a huge job. And it requires a, a very careful sort of training. Who are the gatekeepers of that training then? OK, so we know something about fiqh. Very powerful word then, as we can see. Who are the gatekeepers of that training? What are the avenues to study fiqh? Then you're going to some kind of tradition of some sort, right? Because we're dealing with, as you can see, an incredibly sophisticated subject. So we, there's traditions of learning. So the name for the traditions of legal learning, if we normally, they are called... Yeah. So you have this other word, an important word then, called the madhab. The word madhab is often translated as school of law, but its literal meaning is simply what? Wait, yeah, I, I like the word way. 
A madhab literally is just a path that someone has trodden. So the word madhab is a way, it's a way to deal with this puzzle. And there have been many ways that jurists, you know, brilliant thinkers, brilliant communities of experts have developed uh, over the ages. Particular ways uh, stood the, you know, the, the very difficult test of time. Uh, and they developed, you know, teaching texts, teaching traditions and authorities and so on for an incredibly large uh, period of time. And so these, without any titles right now, we can simply call A, B, C, and D. The point being not then groups or sects or ideas or identities. When you think of the puzzle of way, think about a set of premises a coherent set of ideas of what it means to solve this puzzle. So that's what a madhab is in terms of an, of, an, of an approach. A madhab is a contained set of premises, of ideas, of what it means to know the law. You could simply boil down these contained set of ideas I'm going very low in the chart. I'm assuming no one can see what I'm doing now at the bottom, but okay, I'll write on the side, I guess. So there's two parts then. Madhab as a way, you can simply say, like I said, a set of premises, ideas, a coherent system, if you like. We can say that, coherent system. That's getting untidy now. Of a set of premises again, like I said, of solving this puzzle, and you could simply say, at the most fundamental point, what are they trying to negotiate? It's the question of tradition, and it's the question of rationality. Because I've said to you all already, fiqh, at its nature, at its root, is a human rational activity. That's it. And so every one of these ways have a particular commitment of what is an acceptable, coherent way of using the intellect. Where is the intellect grounded, legitimate, and which activities will take the intellect into areas which are not legitimate and not grounded? So that's one part of the puzzle. The other part, of, again, a core part of the puzzle is about tradition. What I've simply called a sacred past what is it? How do you relate to things like hadiths? Where do they fit in this ordering of authority? Uh, what about early juristic precedent, like the statements of early companions? How do they relate to hadiths, to other ideas? So what is tradition? What are these things that make the law grounded? And these ways have different commitments along that spectrum. These ways have different commitments to what is the role of the mind. Why is it important to first of all see them as ways is it's not simply, well, he said this and he said this and memorizing legal statements, because that figure is not about memorizing legal statements. It's about ideas. Those ideas are built on premises. And so a training in fiqh, for it to be profound and deep, for it to reach this level of real perception, it needs to understand the premises. And that's why typically training happens on a particular way, if you like. That's not to say people must follow a way as a social identity, that, that, that's another question. It's simply to say that you have to approach the question of insight through a coherent system of thought. And these ways are particular systems. Take a system and master it, and you might be part of a professional class. Learn simply statements they say and they say and they say and I like and don't like. You, it'll help you on some individual ideas, but you won't really be able to, to do anything because you haven't had the deep training. Is that fine? So that's madhab then simply as a set of ideas. Madhab historically had another part to the dimension, and this part is really important, but maybe slightly puzzling where it all fits today. Because the madhab is not simply an abstract set of premises, but it's manifested 
in a social group. And so the word madhab also applies to a social group. In which sense you could say it's functioning as a professional guild. Why did these ways develop as they did? Is because they found a way to to replicate education, to authorize teachers, to organize what it means to know the law. And so the madhab was the beginning of colleges. You came to a college, there would be a grand master. There's a fixed idea of training. You go through the training, you get authorized, and then you teach in the college. And when you speak of the law, you're not speaking about personal understanding anymore. You're speaking on behalf of the professional guild, the group of jurists who are following a particular way. So remember, so a madhab then wasn't simply an idea in your head. If you wanted to be a lawyer in Cairo, you have to join a college. So the madhab was a group of people in Cairo. There would be the sheikh of the madhab of Cairo, who would be someone who's gone through the ranks and he's been recognized as the grand master. That's it. He will authorize the teachers of the colleges. See, it's like a guild. They will teach the students. And this guild are ultimately the keepers of the law in that time and place. And so this equation then doesn't actually work without a professional group of people. A group of experts, a group you can go to, a group you could join if you went through the training. In the absence of which these texts, these teaching texts, it's not clear because they're all speaking to a group of people that have to be there. The madhab of Cambridge, the ulama, the group, the scholars, yeah. That's a fantastic question, because that goes into a lot of debates that happened over time. So, so in these you know, very cosmopolitan centers of learning, then definitely Baghdad, Cairo, Damascus, they would have competing c c colleges. Hanafi College, Shafi'i College, they'd have their own systems of training. Uh, an important part of training was debating with the other schools. Again, that's all maintaining the integrity of your system and so on. You'd have appointments that you're, and, and, and so on. In the more far-flung areas, then no. You might have, you know, everyone in a particular locality, they only know about the, the Hanafi school, that's the school of these lands. And you might have other sort of non-Sunni groups operating, but in terms of, if you like, these four ways, then no, no one really has a strong representation. That led to a lot of interesting debates that are important for us to think about right now. Because again, when we think of the madhab, we often hear about it in questions of you must stick to one, you cannot mix and match. You know, these ideas of, if you like, a restrictive idea, an idea of identity, not simply idea of patterns of thought. The reason why these discussions happen again is, uh, yeah, it ties off with these notions. You know, if you're, if you're in this, part of India and they only have the Hanafi law colleges and some guy showing up in your mosque claiming to be a Shafi'i, who's certifying him? Who recognizes this? Our courts don't work on that. So we have simple teachings. You can't follow anything but our law because law has to be something predictable, something you can stamp. But if you're in Cairo, you wouldn't get those statements because the Shafi'is are very well placed. So are the Hanafis. Uh, and that's why this whole discussion of sticking to a school or not, what it means to follow a school, are questions that developed over time. Uh, and part of what it means to understand all of these puzzles is to understand those debates. Uh, if you're going to think about what a madhab might mean in Britain today, the answer is not clear, you see. Uh, other than what, what we can normally take it as a code of personal piety, I think it's a strong, strongly grounded tradition. It gives me a sense of confidence, it ties to the past, I follow a madhab. That's fine on the level of the individual. But if you really think about, uh, is there a professional class producing law in Britain? And if, if you would say the answer is no, there's no way that I can train to be an expert, I can show my expertise and actually produce law, debate with a group of experts on, on these puzzles, then there's no madhab in Britain. If that's the case, then the question comes then, well, what are, what are the status of these various statements people are making on behalf of the law 
in the absence of any group of expertise. So what does it mean to have a madhab in Britain is a bit of a puzzle, you see. Uh, what is the status of these texts? And what are the traditions we want to create here? Uh, on one level, we're dealing with a blank slate. On one level, no, we have a lot to work with. So there, 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 there are puzzles here. Uh, understanding the dimensions of these puzzles uh, is of the utmost importance to someone who's training uh, to really speak on behalf of any of these legal questions. And so the first year on our BA, uh, in the first year, these are roughly the questions we deal with in addition to studying our text, which I'll, which I'll come to. Uh, idea of the development of debates about the Madhab in various periods. What, it meant, what, what circles of learning meant in the most earliest period in these regional schools of Kufa and Damascus and so on. What legal organizations meant in the second and third centuries where people were loosely tying themselves to leading teachers like Abu Hanifa and Shafi'i. What the Madhab meant at the real rise of the guild in the fourth century, real colleges and predictable training. What the Madhab meant when Baghdad fell and we stopped being enemies, Hanafis and Shafi'is at each other's necks, to suddenly being, oh, we're part of an equal legal system that happened in Cairo, where there's four judges in one city, and they're trained to work with each other. So the Hanafi is told, if a woman wants such and such a divorce, just tell her to go to the Hanbali judge, who will give it to her. If somebody has a particular inheritance question, send them to the Mali. So the idea was four schools working as one. And this particular restrictions made on each school in order to make that work. So just what those ideas were. Again, law in that sense, completely separate from state. You know, the, the, the people running these Cairo, you know, in this Mamluk period where these slave soldiers from Central Asia, maybe didn't even speak Arabic properly. Their only goal was just to provide some security. The law was all privately arranged. Uh, how that worked is a particular idea of what the Madhab was as a group. Uh, the Ottoman period is a different other idea where you want to highly define statements of law and reconnect them to the central state power. The caliph as the khalifa, again the sultan as, as the khalifa. So the idea is what a madhab is, what it meant, what authority meant, what the strongest position meant, what it meant to stick to a madhab, to get an idea of how that developed and why it developed. So they can have a much more mature uh, engagement with the question of what it means today or what it might not mean today. Allahu alam. So anyway, that's, that's the lectures of first year, plus reading our text, which I'll come to shortly. Yeah, question. Do you have some specialization in the time so people who specialize up in divorce and marriage? So the answer is yes. People, and that's what we normally, in, in contemporary law, that's what happens, right? I studied law and I specialize in X particular field. So it's perfectly possible, and it perfectly is what people are, are aiming to do. But the question again is just what that specialization means. So if I say I'm specializing in family law, on one question, all it means is that I'm answering questions on family law. It doesn't, at that level, explain the strength of my answers or the legal community who are backing me in giving those answers. So the questions I'm saying are almost like primary questions, which we have to think about. On top of which, by all means, yes, specialization does seem the way to go. Because as we'll see, depending on how much time we have, there's just too much to know uh, if, we, if we think about these questions carefully. So the answer is yes, it's already is what's happening. But just the underlying questions are what I'm aiming at right now. Yeah. So this is the whole challenge, you see. So what I've presented right now actually is an overview of the classical model. And the classical model, like I'm saying, went through various developments, through being in the earliest period simply circles in a mosque and people slowly became famous. From another period where people are clearly stamped and authorized through a college. Again, what's their power? They have no power except that 
they are understood to be the holders of the law. So when your foreign Turkic you know, guy that takes charge of Damascus, his only power is to authorize them, to appoint their judges. He can't tell them what the law is, but in return for giving them that authority, they will give him legitimacy in the eyes of the people. It's a form of power sharing uh, that was much of the middle period. And then, like I said, in some, in some of these Ottoman models, no, it really is part of state again. It's closer to what, what we're doing here, where lawmaking is very much embedded in particular forms of state structures. So all I'm saying right now is there's various classical models for this. And the point of the course is not to be prescriptive, but it's to let people or the students be aware of what the questions really are on what it means to speak about simply fiqh and madhab in Britain today. Uh, and there's a number of you know, ways that this might work, it's just on the, on the classical level. Uh, this group of scholars are part of the government, and you know, there's different ways it works. People might feel much less comfortable with some and more with others, but I haven't got a, a prescriptive answer to that, except that there's different ways that this has happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no doubt, what you're talking about now are extremely specialized areas of legal thinking. Again, each of these ways have their own commitments to that. They might share the word, but they're very different commitments. So what you will normally have, obviously, the professional class, if you, again, you're right, they'll, they'll, they'll be professional class and they'll be students. The individual has no idea of this, or if they do, it's, it's, it, it's only a word. The only reason to learn such specialized ideas is to actually produce law then. So you'll be somewhere in that... Uh, in that orbit, if you're dealing with law on such abstract uh, levels. Okay, my friends, that's it. Fiqh and the madhab, two words, but, but they are the key words. Now, what, what we do here then on, on our course, as I've seen, the, as I've been trying to show to you, these ways uh, are a coherent set of premises and ideas, and it's through really seeing how insights build off of those ideas that you can reach a profound level of understanding, uh, which has really required to think about the questions of law. And so we take one school, uh, one way, again, school has different levels of you know, reactions in people, but one of these ways, uh, as an entryway not to then commit to anything of what that means, that you must be a Hanafi, you can only follow the Hanafi school. These are things for us to figure out over our engagements with what that question is. But currently it's an idea, so you can go through a series of legal statements which are grounded in a particular set of ideas with a particular set of premises to arrive at understanding. The school we've chosen to work on for this purpose is the Hanafi School of Law. The Hanafi School of Law, I think, is interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, yeah, there is something British about the Hanafi School in as much as, you know, Britain's relationship is a, more with India, if you like, than North Africa, which is what the French maybe have, you know, and so on. There is a colonial kind of a connection, and that the Hanafi school, you know, the, the British were translating the Hidayah in the 1800s. Or so, you know, there's a long tradition, and the British have a very interesting Hanafi juristic tradition they invented uh, when they were in India. So there is something about here and our history of law and its engagement with society here that, that the Hanafi school does have more than these other schools. The other thing that makes it fascinating is its particular, you know, how did the Hanafi school stand out from these other schools? You know, you can tell by the polemics against it in these early debates. And the polemics charged it with what? With an overtly extreme level of rationalism. Again, these are polemics. So polemics obviously will make everything extreme. But the idea was there's a particular rational commitment at the very heart of trying to construct authoritative legal cases. Uh, this rationalism, if you like, a real attempt to make sure that, to make sense of everything. And we'll maybe, well, what time we have to think about what that means in a classroom setting, to really, there's no question, there's no statement of law, except that you have to ask why. That's part of the training. You never just take it. And the why is not satisfy me, you know, you know, pigs, they don't eat pigs because they're dirty. It's not that kind of a why, but the idea is how it fits with everything else in the law. The idea is the law is a coherent set of statements with a very clear set of ideas. 
and a person has to be trained in figuring out what the fit of every statement is. And that's at the basis of producing statements of law then. So there's a very particular commitment to the why and the rationale of everything in the most basic teaching texts, uh, which is a set of, you know, the puzzle of Islamic law in the modern world. Everyone's trying to think of ultimately ways to rationalize, to make a sensible statement. Uh, of the classical schools, yeah, this is the one that was most renowned, if you like, for being committed to such forms of thinking. The other statement of polemics directed against this particular school in these very early debates was a commitment to overtly, and again, on the polemic level, extreme, pragmatism. A very great interest in making the law work. Uh, so what do you have, for example, in the Arabian Nights, you know, Abu Yusuf, the student of Abu Hanifa, he is this legal trickster, if you like. Any puzzle you have, I'll make it work for you. You know, Harun Rashid, whatever you want, I'll, I'll, I'll make it work. Again, polemics are always going to magnify and exaggerate, but the idea was, yes, there was a genuine concern that the law has to work. And that's part of what it means to be faithful to God. And so this commitment to being practical, to figuring out what the fit with society is, is a, is a very apparent concern in this legal tradition. And again, these are questions when people think about law in the modern world. These are two ideas, right? The rationale and the pragmatism are two pillars of what everyone's trying to figure out uh, and work with. That people are developing, if you like, new models in their legal uh, discussions. Here we have a, an old tradition which is, stands out for these two interests, and, but it's grounded. And so what's it grounded in? A very interesting, again, idea of tradition. Uh, so the Hanafi school is a school which grows out of these early teaching circles of Kufa. These, and these early circles, you're dealing with, uh, you know, this is before you have Bukhari and Muslim and Hadith collections. So what was early law? Early law was about sitting with companions who stood out for law, for, for knowledge of law and teaching of it. In Kufa, it's someone like Sayyidina Ali, the fourth caliph, who was in Kufa, or Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the great companion, and many others, and their students, and their students. So it's a particular ground, this is why it's used the word sacred past, it's a particular window onto a particular early understanding of tradition, uh, which they're committed to, and through which everything is grounded. Uh, it's, it's not and a rationalism that can go anywhere, it's grounded in a particular commitment to the past. And so tradition is theorized in Hanafi usul. It's always there in the background. Uh, in other traditions, less so. Some of the later traditions were more con concerned with, if you like, hadith texts, as we have. And so the whole idea of what is the puzzle of tradition, it changes a bit. So the Hanafi school that has particular interesting ideas, there is a British connection, there's a particular rationalism, there's a particular pragmatism, and it's a window onto an early tradition. And that's why for these people, the legal cases transmitted from Abu Hanifa, they're not, they're not seen as Abu Hanifa with Quran and Sunnah inventing law. They're seen as Abu Hanifa receiving an early tradition of understandings, which you wouldn't have access to independently very easily, because the historians weren't collecting early traditions with the same energy that they were collecting only hadiths. And so then for them, these legal cases are sunnah. It's a particular avenue to understanding early, and to arriving at early sunnah, if you like. The statements of the earliest community of jurists and, and companions. <coughs> so what happens in these texts, in these teaching texts of, of, of the Hanafi school, again, all schools are, are similar, but again, the commitments are different. It's a commitment I'm trying to look at. This is a text that, that we study. This is a text that, that we study, it's a particular text written in the 7th century, but the important idea here is you have particular legal statements, which is what we actually study, and you have a commentary. And these are, again, all the teaching texts uh, work in this fashion. But the important understanding is that these legal statements, which are part of the main teaching texts, they're all forms of, if you like, ancient statements of law. Again, early sunnah. So although this author, he wrote it in the... Uh, yeah, in the seventh Islamic century, 97% of his legal cases are all from the second Islamic century. So he's not stating anything about what he's doing in his time and place. That isn't the point, the primary point. 
The primary point is this training. And what is this training? It's looking at a pristine set of early legal statements which have come from this early idea of sunnah and tradition brought together with a particular commitment to a particular role of the intellect and studying it for the, for the purposes of fiqh. And, the idea, and that's why everything in the commentary primarily is trying to explain why. Why is it like that? Why do we need that? And in so doing, you'll see how the law fits together, what the basic ideas that these legal cases are portraying, and the very social insights that are informing them. With the idea being, if you can crack the logic of these pristine cases from our sacred past, you're a person of fiqh. If you're a person of fiqh, then you know what to do with these statements in any time and place. The assumption being the very same laws will apply, but if they are seen as, if the rationale dictates something else or the circumstances dictate something else, then that training will give you an idea of what it means to fix that statement of law to work. Not because you want it to, but because that's what it means to be faithful to God. And that's what this tradition is conveying. So it's a particular idea of tradition. Again, all legal textbooks have statements and commentary, but the commitments are subtle. And that's what we have to get at. The commitment here is very clear. It's about a rational understanding of the underpinning ideas of a pristine set of cases that represent early sunnah. And if you crack that, you have fiqh. If you have that fiqh, you'll know what it means to live those statements in any particular time and place. And there's enough in those statements to give you an understanding of what it means to uh, initiate and sustain legal change in a way that's still faithful to the ideas of this tradition and its commitments. So that's basically how these texts work. And that's the premises of this way. And it's a fascinating uh, set of premises. So what we try to do in our course then is to cover an entire text now, that's very uncomfortable. Why is it uncomfortable? Because any text from any part of the planet that's giving you statements of do's and don'ts from a thousand plus years ago is going to have values and ideas that you're going to find very odd. But that's where you have to be very clear. What is the goal of it? And the goal is the fiqh. And you won't be able to ground any idea of law without cracking the fiqh of these pristine statements of the sacred past, if you like, on which these cases are based. So what does it mean? Yeah, we want to cover slavery and jihad and hudud punishments and the whole spectrum of ideas that we find quite uncomfortable today because you're not going to understand them by avoiding them. You understand them by tackling them. What does it mean? You know, so, in, so the way we've divided the topics are, so in year one, we do ritual worship, which is, again, far more profound than it might sound like. It's a complete set of ideas, again, about society, about, you know, and maybe, maybe time's running out, but about society, about science. Because in these ritual worship chapters, you'll see how they reason through substances. Uh, the nature of phlegm is such and such. Therefore, if you vomit phlegm, it might not break your ablutions, but vomiting, you know, food will. It's, it's, a, it's showing people how to work through the questions of law based on our understanding of the world. And so in the most interesting parts of ritual worship, you have the whole set of, again, how to relate law to your knowledge of the world. That's what they're training you in, with their ideas of science. So, so ritual worship actually is far more profound than it might sound like. Uh, and again, and a few other chapters, halal and haram, and uh, there's a few other chapters. In the second year then, which we obviously will start next year, is to look, inshallah, at the two basic chapters of trade and marriage. Uh, trade, the basic idea is, again, there's an idea of well, what are these laws about? What are they promoting in a society? And then there's the question of the legal tricks, which is the contemporary Islamic finance industry. Again, a purely practical drive. What's the le legitimacy of all of that? And what are these particular chapters trying to promote? Then there's the very fiddly question of marriage. It's, it is fiddly because it's to deal with old notions of women and men and families and societies, uh, gender. Yeah, very, very fiddly questions indeed. Uh, again, what are their underpinning ideas? How do they relate to us in the world today, for example? Uh, I was going to read you something from marriage, but we'll have to see how the time goes.
I think we finished in five minutes, right? Yeah. Sorry? Eight. Eight minutes? Um, and then in our third year, we want to be looking at, again, what I'm calling these very fiddly topics, which all relate to the state. But the state comes everywhere. So we, we just did zakat. And the zakat topics, you can't think of them without notions of state and taxation. There's no way to understand those legal cases. Ancient economies, land tax, animals. It's an entire picture of a world. And so every chapter of the law then is a window into every other chapter of the law. And that's why you don't crack it till you've seen the system. Uh, but so the, although the state is everywhere, uh, where we want to tackle some direct questions of state, yeah, that's in the third year then. Jihad is very important. That, that's like the main chapter of p p politics in, in, in a law book. Again, to tackle those questions, to think about, well, yeah, before the First World War, the, you know, what, what do borders mean? What is international relation? There's always some expression of war. And so to think about what these war chapters are in their time, and then the very fiddly question of what it means in our time. <laughs> But it has to be thought through. Again, not, not prescriptively, this is the answer today, but to let them understand what are the commitments, what are the ideas, and what are the challenges. So they can reason through uh, arguments that people are presenting today uh, concerning these topics. Hudud, slavery, uh, yeah, and various questions of judge and court proceedings. Uh, that's in the uh, third year. So that's a simple, so that's a kind of overview. I was going to read through some cases, but I guess I've given some, some ideas of basically then what it really means to have a legal training, what it means to learn how to reason within a tradition, what a tradition is, and how complicated it is to be faithful to a tradition in a particular time in prayer. I, when I say complicated, it's not a straightforward idea. This is the book, that's the law, I'm going to live it. The idea is, well, what, what are those ideas ultimately about, and how do they fit? And what are the forms of social organization we need to even give some weight, if you like, to these legal deductions that we're going to uh, arrive at? And the end result, the hope is, is a group of students who, if they're going to stop at this course, what they're walking away with is not simply a set of dogmatic statements, but a set of ideas and how they interrelate so that they can live uh, what is hopefully an informed life. Whether it's dealing with their kids, their families, their transactions, their travels, their uh, whatever puzzles that happen at work, an incredibly or a profoundly informed way of what it means to live in a way that's true to the ideas and the thoughts and the, and the commitments of a legal tradition. And if they continue, uh, whether it's in formal academic studies or more traditional juristic studies or whether it's forms of community service, people have a, uh, a far more mature understanding of what the texts are, of what it means to master these texts, and what are the real questions uh, that have to be asked. So if they were to build on this, they'll build on a, what is hopefully a fine foundation, and maybe they can uh, contribute in a far more meaningful and mature way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adam. Sorry for talking so long, because I maybe didn't give you all a chance to question. So I'll stop here, so take a few questions and yeah. Um, maybe this is slightly off topic, but I'm just wondering on the back of what you discussed, yeah. what your views are, or how you would respond to the debates that have been going on for some time, that the need for British Islam, mm -hmm. and so, so, so like I said, what I have said, it does feed into this. It does feed into that directly, only because, you see, now, these are classical models. They don't even have to apply. And what I mean by that, we might say, no, we don't want a professional class. But again, I don't know what that would look like if there's no professional class. And it's just, we, it's kind of like saying, we don't want law then. You know, we just want to do our own thing. And I don't think that's how a society will develop. OK, so then we say, no, there will be a professional class. And it does develop. What does that professional class look like? Uh, is it this classical Mamlukid model? We have various schools of thought and separate and you know, separate groups with their own set of premises. If we say yes, are they going to follow traditional models, Hanafi, Shafi'i, and something else? Or are they going to be something else? You know, uh, different ways to build on the past, but that they get currency with people because they are legitimate, grounded, and practical. It's not for me to say. Uh, these traditional models, you know, there's a lot in these traditional models that I think can pan out today. I do believe personally that the statements of law do call towards bringing people together. You know, Islamic law 
doesn't really work without, again, what I'm calling a centralized idea. The mosque, the Friday prayer, zakat, marriage, divorce, you know, women in a divorce setting, the judges. It's all calling people to somehow come together and organize themselves. Ideally, in the classical world, under some head of state, whether he's righteous or oppressive, the idea is coming together under some central legitimizing force. That's what the law calls for. And so I believe, yes, the traditional model, which I think are very sound, they will call towards some organization. We might think it impossible because we're also you know, disjointed, but who knows? And if it does come together, yeah, is it coming together under government, not under government? There's a lot of fiddly questions here. So all I'll say is that's, what, that's where this topic interacts with the question of, of a British Islam. Uh, and, and the answers will, there's a few varied possible outcomes, yeah. Well, currently, all I can say, again, the point of presentation today was what form of training we're giving on, on the BA. And so, like I said, what I hope is to produce a more mature engagement with these questions than we currently have. Uh, and if the goal is producing thinkers who are trained with the tools they need, then it's not currently a prescriptive approach that we are campaigning for a particular kind of relationship with government or a particular kind of non-relationship with government. You know, it's a fundamentally, it's producing the people who can engage in these questions. And so currently you know, I have no prescriptive uh, involvement that I can say in these questions. Yeah. You, you stated at the start that you're, especially as Muslim, you're not clear what the, the situation is in, in Britain so much. This is assuming somebody who has an understanding of fiqh and maybe has gone through Correct. levels of understanding. But for the layman, say most of us in the room who aren't necessarily going to have that body of knowledge, how, following a Muslim, what's your view on that? Basically? Yeah, this is an excellent question. And I know I've I've geared, geared, kind of went away from that whole personal idea just because the bigger picture is what I wanted us to, to think about. What does the madhab mean now? As, as you can all see, it's like it's, it is ultimately personal choice, right? You might choose to follow a particular school. Your parents just do what they feel like. No, no, I'm not maybe your parents do. What I mean to say is everyone's got their own setup. Is it for you to say that their prayers are invalid and your prayers are valid? It's, 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 it's you know, what authority are you saying that? So what the madhab really does re represent, ultimately, it is ultimately a code of personal piety which people follow because they are informed enough to feel it's better grounded than, it's, than competing models. That's, that's basic. And that's why in the, in the old societies they used to say that the commoner has no madhab. Because the guy on the street, you know, he's a farmer, agriculture, merchant, what does it mean for them to be Hanafi or Shafi? There's no meaning, because they have no training, they have no commitment, they have nothing. They're just people that live and go about their, their daily life. So if they have a question on marriage or divorce or prayer, they go to whoever they, they go to, you know, the imam of the mosque, the, the local teacher, and that's what they're, what, what they're expected to follow. That, that's the most that they're able to do in a particular society. And that's why even jurists are, are warned when dealing with the common man not to be too strict on this person. Just, you know, if there's a way to make their worship valid, a way to make their life valid, just kind of massage them and let them get on their way. So, so the idea of even following a madhab then is a degree of learning. The commoner doesn't have this idea. What does it mean professional? What does it mean commitment? What does it mean, you know, they don't have these ideas. Again, it's a very stratified idea of the commoner and the experts, which now it is obviously, you know, it, it, we're very literate and the old model just of this simple breakdown is not that clear. But the simple idea of the past is, it's learning that means to follow a school. And that if you're committed to a school, you're already on a particular level of learning to be able to even speak on, a bit on this topic. But then the question is about no matter and matter. So that's, that's maybe a sub-topic within, like, would you, do you then not follow a matter if you don't have the prerequisite? So you see, what is it? So it's, it's all tricky again. When we think of it as a code of personal piety, everyone has to be told to do their best. And so again, your mum, your aunt, or whoever, you know, this people, normal people, they might not be convinced by such and such a teacher that you're convinced by. So, you, so this is why, you know, what, what does it mean? Everyone just has to do their best on the level of the individual. Again, in the past, it was different because you want to buy a house, you want to divide your inheritance. Madhab law was going to determine whether that works for you or not. Madhab law was an objective reality outside of your mind. It was what's running in the courts. 
If you want to get an, a legal opinion, you go to someone who's been trained in a college, who has a particular affiliation. Madhab law was a reality. Uh, currently, I'm saying we have to build that reality in order to really make this loop work in a way that's really faithful to the brilliant insights of what madhab law is. So now, if now we're on the level of what I'm calling personal piety, then the ultimate ob objective is everyone has to do their best. Of someone who understands what a madhab is, who understands uh, what tra tra traditions are, what learning is, people who are educated in such a way, they will not find it within themselves to do something else. Because they've gone through enough of a degree of learning to see, well, this is far more grounded than this other person who's not consistent and has no tradition behind him, has no experts, who, you know, and so on. It's a simple set of ideas. And if you're convinced of that, then the question comes, well, you know, if you're not doing what you're convinced of, then that's a question between you and God now. Meaning, your conviction is that it's wrong and you're still doing it, you see? So that's what I'm saying. On the level of personal piety, it's learning. And everyone who's here, we're, we're kind of like, like the Hakim said this morning, we're quite an advanced group of people. We have a degree of learning that brought us here. And you're all responsible for your degree of learning. And if you understand what a, a proper tradition of learning is, and all of you are educated, you understand in all of your fields what it means to be educated. And you wouldn't now uh, consider anyone worth following who's not been through some known standard of education in any of your fields. So this is the idea. If you understand what the question is, you wouldn't have a question on following a school or not. And then you would follow it to the degree of your personal piety, meaning this prayer and whatever pertains to you. Uh, and people who don't understand, then they, they have to do what, what, what is easiest and, or what makes the most sense to them. And you can't do more than that. And again, what ties the loop together is, I think, this missing group. Uh, and that's what I wanted to draw your attention to. That's all. Maybe we can do one last question and maybe we'll stop. Or we, should, we, or we can stop. Should we stop? Oh, sorry. OK, the last one. I think that's more an a a anecdotal statement because uh, I think people will find all sorts of people. So, so I, I can't say that's necessarily true or, or not true. Yeah. I think we'll, okay, very last question, and yes, otherwise. I really, yeah. I really do enjoy your overview of the talk today and pointing out where the gaps are, especially with um, regards to Christian Islam and uh, where Madhab and where we all sit and where we're going to go. I really, really enjoyed this talk. No, thank you very much. I enjoyed uh, sharing it with you. Thank you all very much. Please keep us all in your du'as. Inshallah ta'ala, this is a group effort. We're all in this together. And inshallah, the, the real fruits, we hope, will come in the, the time of the hours. We'll plant some things, but I think uh, there's a lot more that will happen, inshallah. Which is, I'm sorry, was that, was that a pessimistic ending? I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> great things are happening, and greater things will happen. There, there you go. Alhamdulillah, Bawamun. Kendrick Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers.